So welcome back. Be before I go back to talk about ramps, so I'm gonna, I'll, I'll finish talking about ramps today and then we'll, we'll uh, go on to seesaws on Monday. I've got the seesaw lecture posted, the video le posted, and so that will be for Monday. Uh, um, I'll remind you the first problem set really is due next Wednesday at, at class time, one o'clock. And for those of you who have never logged into the class, the homework site, please do it in advance, even if you just look at it and walk away. Um, there will be people who will be panicking Wednesday morning trying to figure out how to get in that site. And it's, it may be too late. Like if you miss it, you miss it. Plan ahead, okay? So I, I've put the warning in there, and now people who will never listen to this warning will, oh well. Okay, so some things that I, that I wanted to revisit before moving on with ramps uh, are the idea that, that when you put something on a surface, like, like wagon on the, the wagon on the sidewalk, the observation first off, that the net force on it is zero, and second off, the negotiation process that occurs as that wagon is landing and settling on the sidewalk. I, I, I'm going to take this down one notch. Um, I just want to make sure it's clear to you. Some of these, again, are sort of tools for living. I hope they end up useful to you. If, uh, if, you, if you actually understand it all, get it, get it uh, under control in your head, they can be useful to you, ramps in particular, uh, some of the other issues in here, they'll explain things that you see for the rest of your life. And uh, to go back then to the, to the landing process, so we'll do, I'll do the landing process, then we'll work on, go on to energy and work, and then up, then up the ramps, up and down the ramps. An object that is, that is motionless and staying that way here on the surface of the Earth evidently isn't falling. So something is supporting it. It's something that's supporting it so perfectly that it doesn't accelerate. Me, for example. So, so I'll just, go, just start with me. Like, uh, I'm here. The net force on me is what? Zero. And you know that because I'm not accelerating. Whatever velocity I have, I keep having it. So I'm not accelerating. And acceleration is caused by net force. So there's no net force on me. Zero. And yet I have a weight. So something is canceling my weight perfectly. The something is the floor. It's pushing up on me with a support force at my feet. And that comes about because my shoes and the floor can't occupy the same space at the same time, and they push against each other. Secretly, this is the atoms and molecules beginning to overlap in space, and they have electric charges and all that stuff in them that are, they're fighting each other. They're pushing each other apart. And all the way, I'm supported perfectly. Not too much, not too little. If I were supported too much, I can get the floor to do this to me. I, I'm going to have the floor over support me briefly. And during the, the, the rise, I was accelerating upward. And during that, that period, the floor really was pushing extra hard on me. How did that happen? I pushed extra hard on it. I tried to shove my feet through it. It said, no, 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 and pushed extra hard on me, and up I went. Yeah, Tori. How did trampolines work? Yeah, so this is, this is exactly where I want to go. Um, and so, so you can get the floor to push too hard, too soft on you. You, 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 you want to work at it a little bit, which is where, I, where I'll go in a second. Um, I, I, to, to, to reel back even a little further, remember I asked you last time, is it ever possible for, for this ball to push on the table harder than the ball's own weight? Remember that question? And the answer, I hope you realize, is yes. How do you do that? Well, throw the ball at the table or let it fall on the table. Anything that makes it try to, 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 to go into the table will cause an excessive overlap of those two surfaces. And they'll push extra hard on each other. And during that time, the ball will push super hard on the table. Any questions about that idea? Um, actually, let me ask you this question. This is the other end of it. So the table can certainly put, ah, the ball can push extra hard on the table. No problem. Just throw the ball at it. it will, the ball will push very hard on the table during that impact. Here's another version of that question, approximately, or well, related. Can, the, can a table ever push upward on a water balloon? 
harder than the water balloon's weight. So right now, the water balloon and the table, the water balloon's doing what, what I was doing a minute ago. It's motionless and staying motionless, so it's evidently experiencing zero net force. The table is therefore perfectly supporting the water balloon. It's canceling the water balloon's weight. So right now, the water balloon is getting an upward force from the table equal to its weight. Is there any questions about that idea? The question is, can, you ever, can the table ever push harder than that? You OK the question? Go for it. Oh. For those of you with the clickers, I run on channel AA. It ought to go in, or the, you know, it's this class listed somewhere for, for people with apps. This class should be listed somewhere. I've never tried the app, so I don't know wh what it looks like. Anyway, you, many of you are able to, to, to vote in here. Let's go another couple seconds and then call it a day. And. The majority are saying yes. There are, there are, there are 15% of you saying no. Can you think of a way in which I, we can arrange for the table to push extra hard on the water balloon? Suggestion? <laughs> yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting this stuff. Ready? OK. <laughs> yeah. you're, e you're easily, easily amused. It's good. <laughs> Yeah, we got to make some, some better explosions. That that mess kind of boring. I used to do. I used to use eggs um, for some of these, and you know it wasn't so bad that the egg itself on the table. It was the egg getting on the screen. That's death. Um, it does not come off the screen, and so there were there were years where there, where we had a swath of egg across that screen. All right. The point here is the egg. The, the water balloon was broken by something pushing extra hard on its surface. That's how you break a balloon. Push on it super hard. And the, the way that happened in, the, in this case was the balloon was heading down with a, with a large downward velocity. And the, the balloon encountered the table, and they began to push on each other. And now we're, you know, we're sort of going to get to the, uh, the trampoline problem. If, 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 the, tra if the table had, had s slowed the water balloon's descent gradually, by pushing up, up on it just enough to, to, uh, to just slightly more than cancel its weight and cause it to accelerate. So the, the water balloon coming down, no risk it, OK? If the, the, down, down comes the water balloon. This is the, a super soft table. And now instead of just stopping the water balloon in a millimeter, an action which requires a tremendous upward force to cause the water balloon to accelerate upward so quickly that it comes to a stop, just like that. Don't do that. Slow it gently. Let it keep going downward for a while, but less and less fast until finally it comes to a stop way down here. That's what you do with, it, with the, the egg toss. I, met, I was talking about egg toss last time. You want to catch an egg? Give with it. Don't try to bring it to rest which is, I guess, physics jargon. Don't try to stop it so fast. If you try to stop it so fast, that requires that you push upward on it very hard to make it accelerate upward very fast and come to a rest. Questions about that idea? You stop it fast, big force. Stop it slow, gentle force. You have to push harder than gravity pulls down so that it accelerates upward, but not a whole lot harder than gravity push, pulls it down. Gen just a little bit more. So, so, you, so that's, on a trampoline, that's what's happening with a trampoline, is if, you, if, you throw an, if I were to throw the water balloon, not on the table, but on a trampoline, the, the process will be much more gentle, and the, balloon, the, the water balloon might survive. OK? No, I can't. Yeah. I'm thinking about batting the water balloon, but ah, I'll end up all wet. <laughs> more, more physics wacky doodle. Um, the trampoline itself, and that, is, that brings us sort of to the, to the landing process and to watch the negotiation. So I can do it like this. Let's just weigh, let's weigh the, the, the wagon and the, and the block, you know, blocky kid here. 
the wagon and block weigh about uh, almost 60 newtons. Okay? Right now, the wagon and block are motionless and staying motionless. I realize the, the, word, the, the language can get kind of tedious, but, but if, I, if, I, if I leave too much out, it becomes ambiguous and, and vague. So bear with me on the language. This, the, the, the occupied wagon net, is net force zero. We know that because it's not accelerating. It's just sitting there. It is at equilibrium. This is where, where, where at this location in space and arrangement, it's at equilibrium, which, is, which really means zero net force. So there it is. And that means that the scale is perfectly supporting its weight, no more, no less, because it's not accelerating. If it were over-supported, it would accelerate upward. If it was under-supported, it would accelerate downward. OK? So let me leave equilibrium and gradually lower the, the uh, I guess I could say, let, I'll let this fall onto the scale. And if I let it fall on the scale, uh, for real, I'm not going to let it fall very far. Watch what happens to the needle, which is telling you how hard the scale is pushing upward on it. That, that's, that's a real effect. It's really swinging back and forth about equilibrium. It, it says, sometimes it pushes too hard, too, too little, too hard, too little, too hard. That's the bouncing up and down, in this case, of a wagon on a scale. But it's the same as bouncing up and down of a person on a trampoline. If you land on a trampoline, you're going to do that same bounce up and down until you settle. All right? And during that bouncing up and down, what's the situation? Well, when you are above equilibrium, meaning that you're, you're not denting the surface enough, and, I, and, I, and this requires I, that I remind you that all surfaces give a little bit. They're not infinitely rigid. No such thing as a perfectly immovable, irrigid surface. Even a diamond, uh, you know, it gives a little bit. And as it, as, it, as it bends downward, it pushes up more and more and more, uh, trying to get back to where it was, which is, in fact, another type of equilibrium. It wants to be at equilibrium, but you, but you push it out of the way. It pushes back. And so this, whether it's a trampoline, whether it's a scale, whether it's the table, they all, as they begin to dent, they push harder and harder as you dent them more. So, at equilibrium, the denting is perfect, just enough to, to summon a force that supports your weight. If you're above equilibrium, like this, see that the scale is pushing less hard now. I'm, I have to help support the, the wagon because the scale isn't doing it. It's under supporting the wagon at this height. Or if I go too far below equilibrium, the, the, the scale is dented too much. It pushes up too hard and would, would uh, over support the wagon but I'm making it, forcing it to happen anyway. The, the point is, when the wagon is at equilibrium, it's perfectly supported, no more, no less. If it's ever above, spatially above equilibrium, it's under-supported. It's not denting whatever's below it enough. And so it's got a net force downward. OK? And if you've got net force downward, you accelerate downward. If, you ever, if you're ever in a situation where, where you're denting the, the surface too much, now you're at net, the net force is upward. You're over-supported, and you accelerate upward. So this bouncing motion, and we'll come back to the bouncing motion because it shows up in so many things. This, bouncing, this kind of bouncing motion, it's too slow for you to hear with your ears. But if it were faster, you would be, you'd, hear, you'd hear a tone as the air was moved along with this. This is, the or this is musical instruments. So the world of musical instruments depends on these kinds of motions. V I'm super closely related to this. And what else? Um, the, yeah, all these things bouncing up and down rhythmically. Uh, we'll see clocks are filled with motions like this. So um, we'll revisit this when we look at, at, at scales. And I, I'm gonna, I have a problem set. I, that I'll put up, not yet. The, thir the, th the third problem set will be about bungee jumping. At the end of a bungee, bungee cord, you bounce up and down, a lot of the same physics. So when you land, just to, to, to complete the story of, of, of the trampoline, when you throw, drop onto a trampoline or throw your books onto, your, onto, onto the bed and, and have, they watch them bounce up and down a couple times, the, the, uh, let's, let's let it be, be the books thrown onto your bed, because your bed is sort of a, like a trampoline. 
Um, as a kid, you probably knew this, right? You throw the books on. As they're above the bed, they're falling, free, just free fall, the full acceleration due to gravity. As they begin to touch the bed for the first time, they're slightly supported, not a lot. They haven't dented the bed very far. And so they're still accelerating downward. They're still picking up speed the downward direction, but not as quickly as before. They continue to pick up speed all the way until they dent the bed so far that they reach equilibrium, where they're perfectly supported. And at that point, they're at equilibrium, not accelerating, net force zero, it's all the same idea. But they don't stop because they were heading downward. They still, they're net force zero, but they're coasting. And they're moving downward, they keep doing it. So they overshoot. They go too deep into the bed. And at that point, they're pushed upward hard enough that they accelerate upward, and they slow to a stop. So the whole first, the first trip down the book, book on the bed, it goes, still accelerating, it, it touches the bed, but still accelerating downward. This is equilibrium. It's still accelerating downward right at equilibrium. It finally stops accelerating downward. At that moment, it actually, it's traveling as fast as it ever will, because it's been accelerating downward the whole way to this point, picking up speed. Once it goes past equilibrium, Oh, now it's accelerating upward. It's slowing down, and it comes to a stop down here. And then it reverses. It goes back. It keeps overshooting equilibrium because of inertia. It keeps trying to go to equilibrium, and it, and it doesn't stay there. It bounces up and down. And it would bounce up and down all day, forever and ever, if, if it weren't for uh, friction and air resistance and things that waste energy, which is part of the story with ramps. So that bouncing motion that you've seen of things all your life and the things that which eventually settles out, it's about these motions about equilibrium because of uh, the, the forces and because of you know, inertia and because of energy. And so that's, you know, we'll, we'll try to try that all together. I don't want to like fluster you with details at the moment. Questions about this stuff at this point? Oh, log in. I don't want to log. When something is inertial, does it have net force zero? The answer is yes. These things all go hand in hand, or even in this, they're almost say, ways to say the same thing. If something has net force zero on it, that means there's, there is nothing causing acceleration, because that's what forces do. They cause acceleration. So if the net force is zero, the acceleration is zero, and therefore the velocity is constant. You're, whatever, whatever the object was doing, it keeps doing. So you see lots of things in life where their net force is zero. The, you know, the bus goes by, going straight, going steady. Everybody inside there is experiencing net force zero. And they are moving as inertia has in mind. Or in short, they're inertial. Or equivalently, they're coasting. Same idea. They're moving not because something's pushing them, but because nothing's stopping them. David? Yep. Yeah. When, it, when you throw the books on the bed and they bounce up and down a bit, and there's a moment where it hit, hits equilibrium, which is net force zero. Is that where it settles? And the answer is yeah. It bounces up and down about the equilibrium and then eventually settles there. Because that's the only place that it can be motionless and stay motionless. It needs net force zero to, be mo to, to, to keep doing what it was doing, in this case being motionless. So, so this, th and this is the same as throwing the books. You know, the, it's a wagon-shaped book on a funny green bed. And it bounces up and down about the equilibrium, trying to settle there, and it's settled. And as we'll see with this, of course, it's a scale. It's a grocery scale. What you don't want in a real grocery scale is that bouncing motion, which happens to keep going forever. We go, go to the grocery store, throw, the, the, you know, throw a melon in, in one of those hanging grocery scales. You'll watch it bounce up and down. They have designed the scale to make it settle as quickly as possible so that you're not there watching the needle go back and forth and back and forth. Okay? They deliberately waste the extra energy that's associated with that bouncing motion. But it eventually settles at equilibrium. Yeah? Okay. In, in this story, 
there are, there are multiple forces. The question is about, about the, the pairs of forces not canceling, and specifically the, the, the Newton's pairs of forces not canceling, which I, I think that's, that's essentially your question. If you think, New, Newton's third law makes the observa an observation in our, in our universe that, that if I push on you, you push back on me equally hard in the opposite direction every time. So far, so good? That, what that tells you is that if I push on you, you push on me. We, there, there are two forces, but they act on two different objects. So what happens to me, for example? Well, if your force on me is the only force on me, then when we add up the, all the forces on me, there's only one. It's your force on me, and I accelerate. Okay? The other force in this pair, which is there, doesn't act on me. So it's not part of my, um, my sum, my listing. You know, I, don't, I, I don't tally it up. It doesn't count. It's on, it's on you. And so you might accelerate because of it, but I don't. So, that, so they, nev they never cancel? Is that, is that OK? So in this case, what's canceling here right now, that wagon is, is motionless and staying motionless. So we know the net force on it is 0. So, so the cancellation there is between two forces. There are two forces that are, that are not related by Newton's third law. They, they, there are two forces on the wagon, and they come from completely different origins. One of them is the weight downward, which has to do with gravity and the whole Earth. The other one is the, is the scale pushing upward because with a support force, completely unrelated. Those two forces are totally unrelated. They do not have to be zero. They do not have to be uh, equal and opposite. They could be anything they like. They happen at this point to be equal and opposite. But right now, they're not. Most of the time, they're, they're not. They're not summing to zero. They're doing all kinds of wacky things. Is, is that OK? Yeah, Jack. I'm just confused because I thought you said earlier on that the velocity doesn't determine the force. But it sounds like here it is determining the force. Like if you drop it, it increases in velocity and cannot have the same force. Can you ah. um, so, so Jack's question is, is about that, that velocity and forces are not directly related, and yet there seems to be some relationship between the, the, the object's velocity and the force acting on it. it. It is true that forces do not cause velocity. Velocity has to do with your history. What were, what were you doing? What forces cause is changes in your velocity, may, make you speed up, slow down, or whatever. If I get moving, right now, I'm net force zero. There's no force on me overall. I'm coasting. A force is about to, I'm about to get a force, right? Okay. The wall decided to stop me. So there was a brief moment of a push. And during that time, I, I accelerated to the right and stopped. So forces, they don't cause velocity. That, that, that comes from what you were doing. They cause acceleration. Here, there's a very complicated bouncing motion going on that involves velocity. Clearly, the, 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 uh, the bouncing wagon, it's, it is really moving up and down. So its velocity is upward, downward, upward, downward. What that's doing is it's causing the, the, the uh, wagon to try different locations in space, and therefore different amounts of, of denting of the surface. And it's the denting of the surface that determines the force that the surface exerts on the wagon, and therefore the wagon's acceleration. So velocity, velocity is part of the motion that is choosing what the force is going to be based on, on how much you dent something. I'm not sure I can quite follow the, the, uh, the question, but let, let me try to illustrate this and, and see. Because this, this motion, we'll come back to this motion over and over again. Um, let's let equilibrium, this, let's let this be a, I'm going to drop a ball on a springy surface, and it's going to bounce up and down. You, you can't see the springy surface because I don't have one. It's going to bounce up and down like this, and it's going to eventually settle right here at table level. That's going to be the equilibrium point. You have questions about that idea? Let's watch what happens. We throw the ball. And here it comes. It first encounters the springy surface about up here. And at this point, the springy surface is under supporting the ball. So the ball's velocity is downward, and its acceleration is downward, both. It's moving downward, and it's actually speeding up. It continues that way. The force gets weaker. Uh, the net force on it gets weaker because it's getting better supported as it dents deeper. And right here, but it's still, it's still 
accelerating downward and moving downward and accelerating downward. It's still picking up speed. And right when it gets to equilibrium, that's the first time it runs out of acceleration. There's no force on it anymore. It's perfectly <laughs> supported. It's still moving downward. The velocity's downward, but the acceleration drops to zero. As it goes past that point, something weird happens. It's still heading downward, but now it's oversupported. It's accelerating upward. This is, a, this is one of these occasions where the acceleration and velocity are in opposite directions. Actually, I, I can do this. Yeah, I'll, I'll switch. Let me bounce back and forth horizontally about equilibrium right here. So I'm, 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 I'm being pulled that way. That's, that's, that's the Earth. I'm, being pulled, I'm going faster and faster. I've got two hands. That's the advantage. My velocity and my acceleration both this way. My acceleration is getting smaller and smaller, though, as I get closer to equilibrium. Now it's zero. I overshoot, and now I'm accelerating backwards. I'm being pulled back. I'm being pushed upward so hard that I'm accelerating backwards. I come gradually to a stop. OK? But I'm still accelerating. So now I begin to move back towards the equilibrium. My, my, once again, my velocity and acceleration are in the same direction. I pick up speed faster and faster and faster, get to equilibrium, and I coast through it. And now I accelerate backwards. And I gradually come to a stop. And then, so velocity and acceleration are out of sync with each other. They're, they're odd. It's, 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 they're chasing each other as the, as the bouncing motion occurs. And it bounces up and down and up and down. And velocity itself isn't summoning the force. It's the dent that, that summons the force. Where are you located? It's your position that de determines that. So when you go out on the, uh, on the, what, the Gilmer Bridge and get that, that baby bouncing up and down, it's this, exactly this physics. You bounce up and down, and I think it's, it's faster than once per second is the natural bounce of this thing. And it goes up and down, above equilibrium, through equilibrium, below, through, above, back and forth. So you know, that's, that could be your homework. Bounce up and down on it. Don't break it. The whole class on there at once, no. Question, questions about these bouncing motions and stuff? Because we'll, we'll, they'll keep coming up. It's one of the simplest, most, you know, one of the most important motions in physics, actually, for physicists at least. Can an object support, uh, an object support force be stronger? stronger than others. Um, different objects, when, when, you, when two objects overlap, they will definitely exert support forces. And those support forces will get stronger and stronger as they dent deeper into each other. There will be a limit to how far you can dent them before they, before they break. So for example, th you know, I, I threw the bowling ball on the table, and the, bowling, and the table's quite willing to put up, push up on the bowling ball. Which the bowling ball weighs 16 pounds. The table during that impact probably pushed with 1,000 pounds. It might be able to handle a couple thousand pounds. If you go much further than that, it's, it's, it's going to push insufficiently hard. It will not go up to 100,000 pounds. It will just say, forget it. I, I can't do that. And the ball will go into the table and break it. So, that's, so there are limits to the, how strong the support forces from any surface can be. It's, just, it's the yield point of the surface where it, where it stops following simple laws and, and just starts to, to, to damage. All right? So long story about, about these motions and about the forces between objects. Let me move on then to, th so this is, that's a long introduction to, to this situation. Obviously, the, the wagon's perfectly supported by the sidewalk as a result of a negotiation that happened subtly and sort of not almost invisibly, it's now perfectly supported. And the wagon's not moving. OK. If I tilt, if I tilt this at a ramp, before I tilt it at a ramp, let me, let me revisit work and energy. Because what, what I, where I'm headed with this is that the work involved in other words, the, tr the energy transfer from me to the wagon involved in lifting this wagon from, from, from this level to this level. There's a certain amount of work involved. And we'll come to that in a minute, what, what it means to do work on it. And it, it turns out that it doesn't matter whether I lift the wagon straight up with a big upward force. I have to push hard. This is heavy. A big upward force for a short distance. Or if I use the ramp. Now I can do 
the same job of lifting the wagon and therefore the same investment of energy in the wagon, I can do it with a small force up here exerted over a much longer distance. That trade-off comes about because of, of, of physics and the idea of, of energy transfer. And it, it, this is another one that if you, if you understand how this works, you can predict things like if you build a ramp in your house, you want to know how hard it is to, it's going to be to go up that ramp? You can predict it. It's not, it's not magic. It's just a simple relationship having to do with physics. The same thing with a lot of the, the, the uh, exercise equipment. It's just filled with energy stuff. And, and, and are you doing work here on how much work? And, and uh, I could go on with that forever. Let me take a second, though, to go back to talk about, about work. What determines the force of the ground earth? Presumably that, that, that's a question about what determines how hard the surface pushes when, you, when, you, when you're on it. It, de it depends on the stiffness of the surface, which, is, which characterizes how hard it pushes back for every, say, inch you take it downward. A stiff surface is one that really cares a lot. And, and if you pull it an inch below where it normally is, it pushes back ferociously. That makes it stiff. A soft surface is one that when you take it an inch below where it normally is, it, it just barely pushes back. Who cares? So that's the difference between stepping on a floor, or, you know, concrete floor, which barely dents in order to, to, to summon up enough force to support you, or stepping on a couch, which dents a lot, or a, a foam mattress, <clears throat> dents way down before it summons up, up enough force to support you. And is that okay? I, I'm thinking about about the notion of jumping. You know, what are you doing when you're jumping? You're, you're choosing how hard the ground pushes on you and causing the ground to push on you extra hard. How do you do that? If I want the ground to push on me with a force that's bigger than my weight, all I have to do is push on it with a force that's bigger than my weight. It has to push back. That's Newton's third law, right? So if I come down here like this, and I'm now about to straighten my legs and shove, them in, shove my feet into the ground, that's going to dent the ground deeper than it wants to be. It's going to push really hard on me. And as a result, the net force on me is going to be upward. So that's what it means to jump. And if I were standing on a scale and I did that, the scale would tell me how hard it pushes on me. And it would say, the scale is pushing really hard. One of the sad things about being in your generation is you don't get some of the old technology. The old scales, the ones that I grew up with, the bathroom scales, the ones you're used to bathroom scales, if, if at all. You step on them and, and numbers appear and you know, all the interesting stuff is hidden. The scales that I grew up with had a dial that turned, that told, like this. You know, so so if, if I, you know, I can't stand on that, I will knock it flat. But, but, but it, it would do that, you know, it would tell you how heavy you are, pretty much like that. Now if this was, if, if, if I jumped there, if I jumped on that scale, and, ca for, and caused it to push extra hard on me by pushing extra hard on it, it would read that. It would tell you, oh, wow, you know, I'm pushing really hard on you. And that's what I used to do as a kid. You'd get on the bathroom scale back in the days when I weighed 50 pounds or something like that. And then the scale would read up to 300 pounds. And you could make it read up to 300 pounds by jumping. So you know, look, Dad, I weigh 300 pounds. <laughs> right? You can't do this. It's sad. You have to go find a, yeah, when you go to an antique store, go jump on their scales. <laughs> All right. So work. Let me go back to work and energy. Ah, uh, there was one other one here. Ah, this is a, this is a useful question. Because it's a, there's some language in it. It's a, it's, if a bowling ball makes a dent on the surface of the table when it falls, does that mean the force at which it was falling was greater than the force the table was exerting upward? In this first off, is the idea that, that, that the force of its falling, is that the way I was? Uh, the force at which it was falling, it, when, it's, when it's truly falling, it is not carrying force with it. it, it force is not something you, you carry. Like, like money, like energy. It's not a quantity you, you hold on to. It's something you do to something else. You exert forces on something else. So if there's only one object in the story, 
broadly, one object, no Earth even, there are no forces. Forces are always exerted between things. Is that okay? So if, you're, if, if there's a question, is, you know, is there a force in this situation? And there's only one, one thing going, mo moving along or whatever, no force. Forces are used at the ends of, of, of movements, when you, when you change, during the moments when you accelerate. For example, when a ball hits something, then there's a force. But while it's not touching anything, no force. When the ball is falling, the only force acting on it, it's, it is not force-free here on the surface of the Earth, it is experiencing its weight. So it, it is experiencing one and only one force, it, its own weight, and that's constant. When it hits the table, it's, now it's hitting a, experiencing a second force, one that changes with dent. And during, that, during the, the, the impact process, that, that, that force that the table can exert on the ball can skyrocket to a, to a gigantic value and you know, break the ball, break the water balloon. Is that okay? <sighs> Do forces exist in zero G? Um, in, in, in no gravity. If you're in truly deep space, then there's no gravity around, that, that is, or negligible gravity, and you could be truly zero, uh, net force zero, where you're not having to sum anything. There's just no forces on you. And so in deep space, things coast beautifully. Uh, an example of this would be the Voyager spacecrafts, which were launched I think, pretty much when I was a kid. They're, you know, they're still going. They're way out past the, uh, the solar system. They're dr drifting out into in inter intergalactic space, I guess, get, you know, in that, that territory. They're just coasting. No, there's no gravity, to speak of no gravity, and nothing else. There's, no, there's essentially no air resistance left because they're really, the, the space there is getting seriously empty. They're essentially perfect examples of something coasting with no, no forces on it at all. Is that okay? Second observation worth mentioning is astronauts orbiting the Earth. They will describe that as zero G. And people in those spacecraft feel no gravity. They can't feel it, but they're still experiencing it. They have their weight, the weight of the astronauts up there, you know, they're only 100 miles up or something like that, 200 miles, you know, not, not that far up. They have almost their entire <laughs> Earth weight, and yet they can't feel it. And the reason they can't feel it is because they are falling. Uh, it might, we'll come to that motion. They're falling, and that by itself would be sound disastrous, like they would come to hit the Earth and that would be that. But in fact, they're going sideways so fast that the Earth curves out from under them as they fly sideways and fall, and they don't manage to make progress towards the Earth. It's, it's, they're, they're going sideways very fast, and although they're descending because of the falling motion, so is the Earth. It's bending away from them, and they end up orbiting the Earth. And we'll come back to orbits down the road. That's yeah, Alex? Is that what happens with the planets around the sun? Yes, same thing. The moon is doing that around the Earth. It's, it's in free fall. They're actually both falling toward each other. Uh, the moon does most of the falling because it's much less massive. And the, the Earth and moon system are falling around the, Earth, around the sun. It's all about falling. OK? All right, energy, I do want to finish this. All right, so, so, so the reason energy is worth paying attention to is because it is a, one of the rare conserved quantities in nature. Uh, many other things are not conserved. Velocity is not conserved. Uh, you can add up the velocity of three things in, in an otherwise isolated environment, and those three velocities can change right, left, and center. It's just, there's nothing special about that, that total, the total velocity. There is something special about the total energy. It's constructed out of pieces like, like velocities and whatever. But when you, when you follow the rules and you determine how much energy is, is, is in some isolated system, like uh, the Earth and all of us here, nah, it's, hard to, it's hard to get an isolated system that's properly isolated. But m me and the ball, OK? I'm going to make sure that no energy comes in or out of the two of us. In this case, our total energy is, 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 is rigidly conserved, strictly conserved. So if I have a certain amount of energy and the ball has a certain amount of energy, the sum of those two cannot change. I can redistribute it. I can give some of my energy to the ball like this, and now it has more than it had before and I have less. And then it can give me the energy back, 
and now it has less and I have more, we're back where we started from. But, but the two of us can't change it total. All right? And the act, the mechanical means for giving energy to something is called doing work on it. it some of the language gets awkward. They, to do work on something, I, I can't help it. It is what it is. And the way you do work on something, the rules, again, we, don't, we had no choice in these rules. Some, some other civilization off in the stars somewhere will, would, will have come up with exactly the same concept of work and energy. Um, and they will have the same struggles with energy and climate change we have. Okay, the rules are, are simple. To do work on the ball, to give it extra energy, I have to exert a force on it. If I'm not exerting a force on it, we're done. No work. And it has to move a distance in the direction of my force. It has to move, not me, it. So I'm pushing upward on it and you know, supporting its weight. And right now I'm doing no work because it's not moving a distance in the direction of my force. If, if I get it moving upward, and we'll, the details there will sort of come to with the, with the, with the ramps, during, the, during that lifting process, I invested energy into it because I pushed it upward with an upward force and it moved distance upward. Um, because my force is straight up, this assumes that I'm not throwing it sideways significantly. Because I'm pushing it upward, only the upward portion of its motion matters. So if I push it upward like this, it's still only the, the distance it, it, it lifted. The, the horizontal motion was, was irrelevant, OK? Because that my force is up. Um, and you can often see the presence of extra energy in something in, in, its, in, its, in its situation. This ball, the ball down here, right, that, that's non-threatening. Uh, it has very little energy. If I lift it upward, <laughs> I'm now doing work on it, to there, it's a lot more threatening now, right? This is, a da this is dangerous now because it's chock full of energy. If I drop it, you know what's going to happen. Uh, it will convert its energy from one form to another and hit the floor hard, cause trouble, okay? So energy, you can, sort of, you can see energy in sort of the danger situa situation. And actually, dealing with extra energy is, is, a, is a big deal in life. You want to get rid of energy gracefully, safely in many situations. Um, okay, so that's, that's energy in. Uh, the en energy coming out, you can look at it, you know, I'm pushing upward on it, and it's moving the wrong way, opposite my push. That's a negative amount of energy, and therefore, I'm removing energy from it. All right? The fact that the energy that I put into it is equal to the energy that it takes out of me is... Interesting, and that's, that's why energy is conserved. If I do, watch me do work on the ball, lifting it. I'm pushing it upward, and it's moving upward. And the amount, of energy, the amount of work I did is the product of the force I exerted times the distance it traveled in the direction of my force. So I did a, a very specific amount of, of work on it, and therefore gave it a very specific amount of energy. At the same time, watch what it's doing to me. It's pushing my hand downward with a force that's exactly equal to but opposite to my force on it. That's Newton's third law. So it's pushing my hand downward. And yet my hand is moving upward. It's doing negative work on me. How much? The force it exerted on me times the distance I traveled. That's the same amount that I, of work I did on it. So as I lift it, it's doing, I'm doing positive work on it, 10 units, let's say. And it's doing negative work on me, 10 units. It's sucking the exact same amount of energy out of me that I'm giving it. That's why energy is conserved. It moves from, from one to the other. We're not, both, we're not making some of it en route. All right? Where all this goes, then? Let me try to do ramps here. If I want to lift this wagon from, from this location to this location, I can go straight up with a big force exerted over a small distance. So I, I, I do a certain amount of work on it in a, in, in a short distance big force. That, you know, where, does that, where does that work end up? It ends up as energy in the object. Can I name the energy? Yes, it's called gravitational potential energy. It's energy stored in the force of gravity. Uh, there are two uh, major categories of, of, of energy. One of them is energy associated with forces. 
stretch things, a, 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 a stretch rubber band, a wound spring. Uh, this object lifted off of the Earth. Those are potential energies. They're not, you can't see them necessarily, but they're there. The other class of energy is kinetic energy, the energy of motion. So when, if, I throw, if, if I throw something, while, while the ball's moving, it, it, it carries with it energy in its motion. And that's more, more visible, so it's less considered, it's not considered a potential energy, it's actually an active, present energy. And the energy is conserved, but that doesn't mean that, you, that the individual parts of energy, types of energy are conserved. Gravitational potential energy is not conserved because it can become kinetic energy, like this. Right now, this ball has a lot of gravitational potential energy, no kinetic energy, because it's not moving. And as I drop it, it turns its gravitational potential energy into kinetic as it speeds up. And the, the conversion is perfect, so that, that again, no energy disappears, because it's conserved. So try to finish this, this, this story here. I can do the work of lifting this wagon from here to here with a big force little distance, or I can use the ramp. And what the ramp is doing is allowing me to do that same work of lifting the wagon. There's a horizontal motion involved, but it's irrelevant. No energy is, is invested in that, you know, is involved in moving it horizontally. I've lifted it, but I did it with a littler force exerted over a much longer distance. The work I did is exactly the same. So the ramp is an example of a simple machine. And simple machines, you know, you learn about simple machines somewhere back in grade school. It's sort of part of curriculum. It's always been part of curriculum. Most simple machines allow you to do the work, are all about energy. Can you, do the, can you do the work? And they allow you to change how you do work. They, give, they, they allow you to use a smaller force over a longer distance to do the work you wanted to do, or vice versa. Um, what I left behind is a little bit of the details of how in the world the ramp pulls off this, this stunt of letting you do the work with, with uh, smaller force. I, I guess I will try to revisit that. I don't want to get so bogged down. I'll revisit it a little bit on, uh, on Monday and then go on to talking about seesaws. All right. Have a, have a fun rest of your weekend since it started on Thursday.